All right. Good morning, B-Sides. Uh, today we have an awesome speaker lined up. He is uh, Will Baggett. Uh, he is the director of digital forensics for Project Safe Escape. He's a former CIA officer and a seasoned uh, speaker. He has spoken at DEF CON 19, uh, spoken at numerous B-Sides to include B-Sides Las Vegas, and just generally an overall awesome individual. So I'm going to hand it over to Will to kick things off with digital forensics and insider threat. Thank you for the handoff. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to B-Side San Antonio Virtual. Hopefully the last year we do virtual. This first 25 minute talk is going to be about digital forensics, the insider threat. And from that, the job openings are all digital forensics insider response and then every so often you'll see insider threat this is going to cover what's the career track look like for insider threat what does the day look like what do the duties consist of if you're interested great if not you spent 25 minutes found out you didn't like the career track and you move on no harm no foul so detecting a threat it's not really magic there's some basic principles yet doug Henning, thank you very much Wow. I don't usually talk about myself, so I'm a little surprised to let this in here. So <laughs> I worked in financial technology. I went to the intelligence community for many, many years. I went to NATO as a public speaker, training the special operations forces on cybersecurity. From there, when COVID hit, I went to a consulting firm and began specializing on the commercial side of the insider threat. And the insider threat for commercial gives you access to every, pretty much everything where on um, the intelligence community, you have a little slice of pie, you look at the slice of pie, you're in your stove pipe, that's all you see. You don't see the entire network. You don't see the granular detail of when people log in, when they badge in, when they badge out, where they go, you don't see the full picture of their life. Incident response though, at the high level, we've got the data breaches, usually external. I've got the picture of the dam. It might be because of a leaked passwords in the GitHub repository, SolarWinds1234. You've got something hitting the outside of the network perimeter, causing an event to have data leak out. In modern terms, it takes one unexpected action to breach the firewall. They needed to get data out of a secure facility on Scarif. The rebels used a hammerhead corvette to physically penetrate the firewall, the ring, uh, preventing any transmission coming out from the planet. So we had an external attack on the firewall, data's leaked out, episodes four, five, and six occur, maybe rebels, maybe Mandalorian. Episode seven, eight, nine never happened in my world. The insider threat, we've got data loss enabled by employees. We're not necessarily talking about a event like the Colonial Pipeline breach where an employee possibly clicked on a phishing email. Maybe they didn't update the patches. That's more on the incident response. For the insider threat, we're talking someone disgruntled, maybe a Snowden. Oh, maybe an Ames, maybe someone like at Pfizer that was working to leak the data to the Chinese researchers. That's been in the news. And when we do penetration tests, this all ties into the insider threat to try to drive the point home. A black box test, they don't give us any data. Just go after the corporation. Here's the scope. We're not going after AWS. We're not going after Azure. We're only going after this slice of the network. A white box attack, you get the credentials, you get logon validation, access to the facility, you're inside the network. And then if you've taken your CISPA or your certified ethical hack, I can't talk this morning, certified ethical hacker, these are the more damaging penetration tests because you have access, which is exactly what an insider threat would have to your organization. The most common cause of a security incident is human behavior. From that, it could be someone picking up the USB drive in the parking lot, someone who's been fished, someone who clicks on the wrong link, someone who wants to just make things easier and share the files at home or they log, log on to Google chat. That's an entirely different piece of threat where if you log on to your Google account, 
on the corporate network, all of your data that you work on is going to be retrieval through Google Takeout. So now if you leave the corporation, all that data is still available to you for nefarious purposes that would possibly harm the organization. It only takes one inside threat actor to lower the defenses. Here from Avengers Endgame, we see Nebula. 2014 Nebula in 2023, literally breaching the defenses, letting the adversary into the network. And we saw the second half of the movie where because the defenses are lowered from an insider threat, basically we have no more Iron Man. We have Captain America gone back in time. We have a new captain. A lot of things changed because we had an insider threat. So in the CIA, the traditional motives for espionage or MICE, you see the acronym Money, Ideology, Conscience, or Ego. We updated that to be compromise or excitement. Some people just like the thrill of committing espionage and being caught. They need that ego boost. Compromise could be something more like blackmail pictures of whatever event you did that you shouldn't have. Someone's got on tape. They've got a tweet. They've got a video recording from your ring doorbell. If you don't do X, we'll release Y to the media and embarrass you and ruin your career. That's been the usual hallmark. In the early 2000s, CIA updated, well, excuse me, the commercial motivations that we've seen working inside of threat, money, ideology, career. I'm unhappy at this corporation. If I take the data here and move it to the next position, I can become a director working over this, and getting a large salary increase, having more power, more prestige. And I'll show the previous employer that I was worthy to have this previous position. External activities for insider threat, we're talking possible hacktivism, political means. This corporation is doing X. I don't agree with X. I believe in Y. I'm going to make sure that the corporation sees why Y is the better option. The CIA updated the MICE acronym to become RASCALS Reciprocity, Authority. Scarcity, commitment, consistency, career. Some of the C's remain the same. Liking and social proof. The authority is, well, if you can, you meet someone overseas, you chat them up as a case officer. If you've really got the authority on this department and you're really doing this research, show me what you're working on that you're so proud of because you want to validate your authority or conversely, someone calls using voice spoofing, some of Alyssa Miller's uh, deep fake technology that she spoke about. The call appears to come in from the CEO. And it says, if you don't commit to perform this wire transfer to this non-standard account immediately, your career is in trouble. It sounds like the CEO. It looks like the CEO. You can spoof a phone number with a spoof card on your phone. So now the employee has then transferred millions of dollars to an external account. And with the wire transfer, once it's gone, it's gone. You can't get the money back. That would be authority scarcity. This is the last opportunity. There's only three seats left on this team. Click here to join the team. This is a little bit more of an accurate picture of why someone might commit or be susceptible to social engineering. One of the things, I know there's a career track with Kathleen. One of the things we taught at NATO was the social engineering as you come to the end of your career. You go to LinkedIn, you turn on the beacon to say, yes, I'm interested in new opportunities. The recruiters come out of the world. Work, hey, we know you're happy down in San Antonio, but we've got this six month, no benefit opportunity for you here in Ugawaga Dugu. But you need to move immediately. And after the contract is over in six months, you have no job. We've all seen these weird offers. But for the social engineering piece. You go to thispersondoesn'texist.com, you go to mail.com and create a valid email address, something non-standard. And now you can become that corporation. I can say I work for Apple, I can say I work for Dell, for HP, this person doesn't exist in a non-standard recruiter.com style email. People were being approached by foreign intelligence services for, hey, we know you're leaving the service. What systems were you working on? What are you familiar with? What are the issues? And as they begin to build the report through technical interviews, there's the elicitation of what have you really done? And 
you're unexpectedly giving away classified intelligence that you're not aware that you're leaking out. The same thing could occur on the insider threat of the social engineering, just like happened two days ago with Slack. Someone came into the Slack channel for EA, which is kind of funny because EA is always out for DLC packs for every game you buy, but that's my personal commentary. This kind of straddles the line between insider threat and inside or incident response because they came in through the network, they looked authoritative, and they convinced the help desk to elevate privileges to gain access to the system. It's still a modern method. So we have the human factor. We saw that there's a technical collection gap with the Slack channel, the gaps in coverage, I'll touch on that in a second, the human factor, help desk wants to please people, they have metrics they have to meet. Security sometimes becomes secondary, not to disparage close support help desk. There's a fine line between helping individuals and people who appear to be authoritative. So that's kind of Strauss line yet again. The gaps in coverage, we're talking about things like on the Apple network, if you log in with your Apple ID on a corporate Mac, if they don't have the proper hardware installed for uh, endpoint security, you can just go go to mail, create a draft, put a sensitive document in there. And then when the network syncs, now if you look on your phone under draft on your email, there's the document. It wasn't a blocked network, but it's still a channel that people use to exfiltrate data from sensitive corporate networks. It's, a little bit tougher to block. The insider threat team is a little bit different than dealing with the incident response team. We've got human resources as a partner, security in the legal aspect. Legal because what we're looking at is a possible adverse action on someone's career, a resume generating event, as they say. Human resources has data that needs to be shared with the team. And security because this is an internal threat. Sometimes we do have the physical threat one client had a subcontractor threaten to come in with COVID and cough on the team that was working in the facility. They did it over corporate teams, over teams chat. I was able to go in with O365 compliance, pull it back together with Magnet Axiom and put the pieces together. He logged on at home at this time, contacted these people, hear the chat messages, hear the threats and send the report off. But we'll touch as to what that means. The watch list, the new hire, yes, it still happens where you have corporate espionage. A gets hired by B, but they're still employed by A to go in to see what information you can glean about the uh, corporation. What are you looking for? Uh, what new phones is Apple developing? Those type things. If someone gives a two week notice, it's fairly common to be put on advanced monitoring if you're going to leave. What data are they going to collect before they leave? Are they going to turn in their notice and then burn two weeks of vacation? Or are they going to go in and harvest files for exfiltration for their new position? Uh, if you have a performance drop, a performance improvement plan, which is usually key for you're on the turkey farm, you're going to get let go at any moment, you just don't know it. What are they doing before they're being asked to leave the network? Uh, level of access, insider threat teams, of course, with the level of access we have, have a higher degree of scrutiny who watches the watchers. The SOC administrators, the network administrators, they always get a little bit more scrutiny because of the level of access they have. Lifestyle concerns. I'm picking on Bob a lot. If Bob shows up, if he's making 40000 a year as a new hire, as an intern, and he shows up in a brand new Tesla with no other means of support, that's interesting. How did he do that? Did he win the lottery? Is he, did he strike it rich in Dogecoin? Or is there something else going on here? Uh, I'm in Savannah right now. There's a large aerospace manufacturer, and they're well known for constant layoffs every two to three years for their technical community. So if you believe there's going to be a layoff, are people harvesting the files to move to a competitor? Are bonuses being slashed, i.e. Christmas vacation? Are you in the jelly of the month club instead of getting enough money to pay for the in-ground pool? Manage attrition, if you believe you're in the lower class of performers and you're going to be let go, what files are you harvesting to take with you for your new position? And if human resources doesn't provide that basic Excel file that you can import into Slack just for the human watch list for enhanced monitoring, that's a partnership that needs to be created. 
Uh, one thing coming out of a got nine minutes left. One thing coming out of a certified fraud examiner was a fraud triangle, rationalization, pressure, and opportunity. I'm going to be let go. I've got the opportunity to get these sensitive files, and I can do it. I worked on this. I've got the reason to have it. I deserve to take this with me. I deserve to get wealthy off this instead of leaving my work behind. It's very simple that people do this psychologically when they're being let go. Now, the watch list sources, repeated access violations of digital loss or data loss protection. Did they try to insert USB drives? Are they copying and pasting sensitive data, credit cards, social security numbers? Are they asking for elevated access through the help desk? Previous employer in the intelligence community, if people kept asking for restricted database access and they didn't have rights, that went to security. That wasn't just a, you don't have rights and no thank you. That was reason for concern that would go on people's permanent records that would possibly trigger polygraphs. Repeated access violations. You don't have access to plans and intents for B-Sides 2025, but you keep trying to access this file. Let's see what's going on with you. Things such as you're trying to install Slack, shadow programs, Dropbox, things beyond the corporate scope. And one thing in red here is the need to know. Yes, Bob needs to know this for his job versus need to know. Yeah, that would be neat to know the plans and intents for the next five years, but you don't need to know that for the scope of your program for security. Data exfiltration, if you picture a toddler squeezing Play-Doh, it's about the best analogy, and there wasn't really a good gif of that on uh, Google. You can only get the data out so many ways, whether it's a USB, SD card. People block USBs, but they forget to block the SD card ports. The Bluetooth file sharing capability on some of the Macs. Corporate email leak is the number one way data is removed from the network and put to a private hands that part shouldn't go. In printing, we're not talking so much print to PDF and shade, save on OneDrive, but actually printing the files at home. The chat and shadow IT, whether it's Slack, BlueJeans, Zoom, the plethora of online services that are out there to share data that we've all encountered the past year. Are they installing these files on their corporate machines? And they shouldn't. The sync services, whether it's Google Takeout, the Apple file system where you can go to data, I think it's retrievemydataapple.com, something like that. But you can get the copy of everything, all of your text messages, photos, call logs from Apple, just like you can Google. So the sensitive document that you sent over iMessage is still retrievable. Is that something your corporation is permitting? And in the cloud storage, one great thing Chris Vance brought up last week at Techno Forensic in Myrtle Beach, are the logs monitored? That's something we can pull into Axiom to see if they're uploading data. Briefly touch on the accidental data bit, uh, exfiltration. Facebook Messenger at one point harvested all the text messages that were on a corporate phone. So in addition to your Facebook message accounts, it was everything corporately related. We had people in the service who wanted to use that for coordinating a rival departure of their units. Once we explained from a security aspect that this is now going to Facebook for marketing, it's there forever. We don't need troop movements coordinated through Facebook policy change, but this is still something that can be a risk to your organization. In the home stretch here, the logon warning is real. You do consent to monitoring when you log on most corporate networks, and here's what I mean. With Splunk, I can get network data traffic, log on times, badge access, when you went to lunch, when you logged in and out of SCIF, when you can't left from the facility. Are you arriving at a party at odd times? The office and chat content, as well as the documents created in 0365, as well as all the versions. Did you rename sensitive file.txt to Bob's resume.txt? Remote file access with Druva, if that's installed as an endpoint, I can connect remotely, just pull your registry. We'll run that through Axiom to see what the last files you examined were. The tools to see what an individual has been up to versus the entirety of a dead box forensic case, smaller, lighter, faster. So we can move on to a false positive. This person really isn't doing anything nefarious. It's a false positive. Yes, they move files in bulk, but we told them to. You're moving from this division to that division, move the files with you. No harm, no foul. Lastly, McAfee, when enabled properly, you can see 
when the USB drive was inserted, what files were moved there, what was printed, what was copied and pasted to the clipboard, whether it's allowed or denied, but that's still recorded for perpetuity and to, to get the better picture of what the actor has been doing. I mentioned mag magnet axiom. We had one case, a million files plus when we did the full forensic collection. But there was only one Excel document for someone who didn't do that. They didn't use Excel in their group, lucky guy. We can see the uploads to AWS. We can see the presence of Shadow IT, do they have Slack installed and what files are on chat, uh, Slack? One thing to consider might be the use of a honey file. Here we've got super interesting company file that no one would touch except the internal threat team, knowing this is something that's, let's see who actually goes out and collects it. Much like a honey pot for network intrusion, same principle applies here. Another thing to throw out is can versus should. Just because you can provide someone the detailed user data for every action on the network, should you? If Bob in IT wants to see what Mary in accounting is doing and he has access, is there written documentation or is this just someone who's curious about it for whatever reason? And if you're uncomfortable, push back in writing, go to supervisors, go to leadership, get concurrence before you accidentally breach someone's privacy. The risk mitigation principles, control the access, there's separation of roles, and there's a need to know. Document everything. I've got to get this to a wrapped up point here. Develop an SOP for sensitive files, i.e. child pornography. If you run across that, what are you going to do with it before you touch it? If it's not written down and documented, it didn't occur. Two is one, one is none, that's just a fun saying. Now the system worked. We found somebody, there's an incident. We're going to have a meeting, who's the imposter? Three person rule, you can run a time crunch here. I'm used to a full hour, 25 minutes is good. Before you go to leadership and management with we found this incident, have two other people verify the finding to say, yes, this looks suspicious. Okay, did we think about this, that, or the other? Because if you go forward and say, we believe, Bob is committing actions that look like insider threat that could damage his career. Verify it. When you have it verified, we go to leadership with a report. Be prepared because the world is great, just like Robert Ritter from Clear and Present Danger. The managers might say, well, yes, they did that, but you know, it's not really a big deal versus give us all your notes, cease investigation. We're going to prosecute the individual. We're going to terminate them. It can go in a variety of directions, but be prepared for the, well, it's not really that big of a deal, even though it hits all the hallmarks of insider threat and data exfiltration because the C-level executive, they may not feel it's a big deal. That does happen. And it was a little surprising on the private side to have that type of letdown for, oh, if you get paid that much money, you can take the data. Last thought here is we're coming up on time. The intelligence community has maximum tour lengths for forensic Analysts, when you're looking at sensitive materials for your own mental health, if you're performing a role like this, rotate out every so often, every year, two years, do something different, do an audit, uh, do NERC SIP compliance, but get your head out of the lost luggage every day is a bad day department. Because if you can't take care of yourself, you can't take care of other people. In conclusion, identify the key dates and the scope of the investigation, mind the gaps in the collection, what have you not considered, document your events and rotate out on a regular basis. That's my Twitter, that's my email, and thank you for coming to the talk. In the peak of the pandemic, ETSA students and graduates notably struggled to learn internships and full-time roles in the new virtual environment. Our founders heard their voices and created the CompTIA student chapter at the University of Texas at San Antonio just one year ago and constructed a like-minded cybersecurity community. In pursuit of their mission, the CompTIA student chapter at UTSA aims to transition all members from college students to qualified entry-level cybersecurity professionals through providing a cybersmart community, hosting professional guest speaker events, facilitating collegiate cybersecurity competitions, company spotlight events, and providing support for acquiring professional cybersecurity certifications prior to graduating. 
The chapter serves as a growing community resource for over 300 active student members, alumni, and professionals, and has just been awarded the 2021 Most Outstanding New Student Organization at UTSA by the University Life Awards. We continue to extend all of our support to new talents breaking into cybersecurity. Have we interested you? The chapter is always looking for ways you can gain support to be able to expand this amazing community. If you would like to help, we are always open to discussing possibilities for future events, and we are looking for enthusiastic speakers and companies who would like to connect with UTSA cyber students. We are also open to collaborating with others to put on competitions, to capture the flag, or other engaging events to help bring our chapter members resourceful opportunities to develop. If any of this grabbed your attention, feel free to reach out to one of our members in this event's official Discord server under our channel, the CompTIA student chapter at UTSA, for any questions you may have. We're looking forward to hearing from you and possibly working with you. Thank you for listening and hope you enjoy the event.